Is that better? Oh, wow. Now I can really yell at you. Uh, our, our women's retreat was here this weekend. We had over 300 women here on our campus. And some of you were asking, because I heard y'all walk by, and you were like, what's with the curtain back there with the lights? Uh, uh, that's not anything special we're doing just for today. That was part of the decorations uh, for, for the women's uh, retreat. Uh, and I think it's a sin to hurry in the presence of beauty. I just thought, I thought it was beautiful. And they said, we're going to take everything down on Sunday afternoon. I said, no, leave that up. I like that. I think that's beautiful. Uh, I don't think it'll be there forever, but again, it's a sin to hurry past beauty. So the next time you see somebody, uh, 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 you know what brusking is? Street singers to sing out on the street. Don't hurry past. Just kind of stop and take it in a little bit. Uh, beauty has this capacity to kind of recalibrate us. has nothing to do with what I'm preaching about, but I walked out earlier. There's like six people in the lobby looking at the screen. I said, what are you looking at? And they said, that curtain up there. I said, it's beautiful, isn't it? Makes you want to figure out what it's all about. Has nothing to do with what I'm preaching about today. I just didn't want you staring at that and not looking at the text. John chapter 12. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about your style of relating to Jesus. Your style of relating to Jesus. Everyone in this room has a way. When I say a style of relating, here's what I mean. It's kind of like you understand personality. Everybody has a personality. By the same token, you have a manner of relating to people. It's as, it's as indicative as your personality. It's as, uh, as pronounced as your personality. So you need to understand the way in which, the manner in which you relate to Jesus. Uh, we're in John chapter 12. Let me just read the first eight or nine verses. And there's four characters that are mentioned. And each one of them represents a different way of relating to Jesus. And so here's what I want to do. I'm going to read the text. And I'm going to come back and just talk about the characters as they appear in the text. And, and, and then I'll give you a question that each one of them asks us. A word that, that kind of characterizes their style of relating. And then a statement that summarizes their style of relating. Or, or as I would say, explains their life. Uh, you, you should ask yourself this morning, if I had to boil it down to one statement that explained my life, what would it be? Anyway, John chapter 12, verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. Uh, very simple story. It's kind of set in the context of a dinner party. They're having a dinner in Jesus' honor. Four characters show up. And I just want to, each one of these for me represents a different way of relating to Jesus. And so let me just start with the way they appear in the text. First, there's Lazarus. Here's the question that Lazarus asks us today. What does Jesus know about you? What does Jesus know about you? Now, keep in mind that in chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. He got sick and he died. He was dead four days. He was beyond all possible hope of resurrection, any kind of mysticism, any kind of Jewish legend that says the Spirit hovers over the body for three days. Jesus waits till four. So there's no uh, question as to who gets the glory for what's about to happen. And so Lazarus's question is, what does Jesus know about you? And when you realize that it's everything, that he has seen you at your absolute worse then you stop trying to save face you stop trying to manage his impression of you you stop saying and singing things you don't mean and you just kind of sit down on the inside that's his question here's the word that Lazarus brings to us it's just experience it's just experience. It's just I've experienced Jesus in a way uh, that, 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 that kind of resettles and reorients everything about my life. Now here's his statement. It's simply this. Presence is the language of appreciation. Presence is the language of appreciation. There's a lot of things going on in the room. And the Bible just says this, that Lazarus was among those who reclined, uh, who was reclining with him at table. Now, uh, the, they talked to him, they say at table, basically they were eating dinner. Now, boys and girls, I want you to ask your mom and dad to let you do this sometime within the next month. So pay careful attention. The way they ate dinner, uh, back then in the Bible days, I know we, this is crazy, but everybody sat down and ate at the same time at a table. And it wasn't just a piece of furniture that you stored stuff on that you didn't need. 
Uh, we don't even build houses anymore with a formal dining room. And then, remember that was a big deal? It was kind of like, here's our formal dining room. But, but when they say at table, that was a big thing. We don't have time to go into that today, uh, boys and girls. But here's the thing I want you to ask your mom and dad if you can do. When it says he was among those reclining with him at table, they didn't sit in chairs when they ate. They laid on the floor. They leaned on one elbow, and they, and they pointed their feet away from the table, and they ate with one hand. Now, they, they would lean on their left hand and eat with their right hand, and they would just kind of feed themselves. And so sometime in the next month, don't you ask your mom and dad if you can just not eat sitting at the table, but you can just recline. You can just lay back and just eat with one hand and just sit around talking to each other. It was a long, it was not efficient if you went to one of these dinners. It took a long time. Not that there was a lot of courses, but there was foot washing, and then there was just hanging out, and there was bread, and there was wine, and there was all this stuff that was taking place, and no one was in a hurry. It was not efficient. No one went to the Chick-fil-A drive through and threw the, the chicken nuggets over the back seat while your kids caught them like seals ooh, 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 as they sped off to the next soccer practice or the next tutorial. They were laid back with their mind on their money and their money on their mind. I mean, there was no hurrying going on, okay? And Lazarus is there, and he's the guy that Jesus has raised from the dead. What's he going to convince Jesus of? And so his statement is simply this, is that, oh, man, presence is a language of appreciation. He was among those reclining table. I just picture Lazarus pulling his keys out about an hour in. He kind of goes, Jesus, I might need you to drive me home uh, when this is all over. <laughs> Can I just lay on you for a little bit? And everyone's just kind of like, what's with this guy? He just so, he, here's what's with this guy. After being raised from the dead, he was just glad to be around him. No face to save, no reputation, because he realized that Jesus has seen me at my worst. He, he, because of this, he's able to relax and enjoy everything Jesus does and everything he provides. He, Lazarus is kind of, he's, he's known for what he enjoys, what he has, not what he doesn't have. He's not a big complainer. Uh, here are some things about a Lazarus, about a current day Lazarus. It's simply this, this style of relating. Uh, they can't tell you how to get it because he just experienced it. Uh, a lot of people ask a Lazarus, hey, how do I get like you? That's the real question beneath all the questions. And he's like, not very helpful because he's like, I just, I don't know. I just, uh, his or her life is a threat to the religious subculture. If you look down in verse 9, uh, the Bible says this, that when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing believing in Jesus. No one's going to believe in Jesus because of Martha, who we'll get to in a few minutes. But people believed in Jesus because of Lazarus. And so in, 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 in the religious leader's mind, this was a two for one. We want to kill Jesus and we want to kill this guy Lazarus who, has an, who had an experience that, that we cannot discount. And so when I say their, their life is a threat to the religious subculture, they don't fit in well. Uh, Lazarus forgot the score. That will make sense as we get going here. But he just he forgot the score, uh, has a deep faith that he often cannot explain in ways that make sense. He just doesn't. It's kind of like he, he can't explain it, but it's there. Uh, Lazarus does. Uh, people appreciate this person from a distance, but they, they seldom let Lazarus, a Lazarus type get close because people are appreciative, uh, but they're kind of intimidated because it's a reminder. I think he may have had it. I think she may have had an experience that I've never really had. I've learned the language. It's like the person that learned Spanish on the way to Mexico on the van of the mission trip. And the way they learn Spanish is they put an O on the end of every word. And they get to, they get to Mexico and they're like, do you all want O to come O to church O? And people are like, you know, it's not Spanish, right? Uh, the person that's never had a real born-again experience, a death-to-life experience like Lazarus, they just think, hey, I can learn the lingo. And, 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 and over time, people just kind of move away. But that person is really drawn to Lazarus because he doesn't know the lingo, but he's had the experience. Uh, kind of lives with this, it's all going to be all right in the end. It, 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 what do you mean it's all going to be all right in the end? This is kind of a, just a summary, a thumbnail sketch of this person who has this style of relating. A Lazarus can be a man or a woman. It's not just, oh, it has to be a man. No. Uh, being around a Lazarus, when I say they have this mindset, it's all going to be all right in the end. If you've ever been around someone that survived cancer, it's convicting about all the little things you obsess over. 
It's like a picture. A friend, a friend of mine sent me a picture uh, recently. I was going to bring it today, but I thought, no, it's family worship. They wouldn't go well. But it was from the set of The Passion of the Christ. Some of you have seen it. It's been going around as a gift. And it's Mel Gibson, Sandler, the director, talking to Jim Caviezel, the actor, who's just, you know, it's the crucifixion scene. And so it basically says, so Neil, the caption my friend sent me because my friend loves me, so Neil, tell me about your bad day. <laughs> and I wrote back, I'm going to get you for this. Uh, but when, when I say that he has this, uh, Lazarus, he or she has this, it's going to be all right in the end because they've, they've been to death and they've been raised to this newness of life. And so they don't freak out about things. It's like a person that has cancer and, and, and they get healed or they get cured through surgery or whatever. The, after that, they're kind of like, hey, man, relax. You should enjoy life a little bit more. Get dessert, okay? Don't get, get water. Get a beverage, okay? Just spend some money on yourself and enjoy your life. You're like, ah, ah, ah. Because this person no longer believes that because of my discipline, my life is what it is. It's because of what I experience. The experience changes, reorients everything about them. Finally, this a Lazarus lingers long after dinner. A Lazarus lingers long after. If you have a Lazarus to your house for dinner, at about the time you think it's about time to wrap it up, at about 9 o'clock, they're like, hey, you want to play Monopoly? <laughs> and you're like, hey, that's a long game, dude. Uh, I never lose. Let's go. Put on some coffee. Because you don't know what to do. Because their capacity to enjoy the relationship exceeds your willingness to enter into the relationship at that level. That's a Lazarus. Second person that shows up with the story is a Martha. Is a Martha. The Bible says, you know, that Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Two word summary of Martha's entire biblical narrative Martha served. Martha served. Now, this wouldn't seem like a very big deal, but if you just make notes, if you're one of the four people taking notes today, and by the way, don't try to write all this down. Uh, just t- when the thing comes up, the sketch comes up, just pull out your phone and take a picture. Uh, back in Luke chapter 10, about verse 38 to 42, there's a story of Mary and Martha, and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. Martha, remember, comes out of the kitchen. Lord, don't you care? My sister's left me to do all the work. Tell her to get up and help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried about many things. Only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen that which is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Fast forward. That was about midway through Jesus' earthly ministry, best we can tell. We're six days from the end. Martha's still doing the same thing she's always done because it's all she knows to do. She doesn't know what else to do. And so when you look at Martha, her question is, what does Jesus need from you? What does Jesus need from you? And she thinks, Jesus needs me to get everything ready. Need me to just serve and serve and serve. Her word is effort. Effort. Exertion. Uh, Her phrase is, hey, I express my understanding through my effort. Watch me work. And it doesn't go well for her. She exerts a lot of energy around serving. Uh, This is another thing, a summary of her. She knows what needs to be done, but does 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 not have a sense of what God is doing. She knows what needs to be done, but doesn't have a sense of what God is doing. And often, all of her exertion, her effort, doesn't feel connected to a bigger picture than just her own desires. Most any time you see her mentioned, she's serving. Not many people want to be around her, but they appreciate her from a distance. Uh, Martha lives from the outside in. If you remember in chapter 11, Mary comes out and all these people come with her. No one comes with Martha. They, they appreciate her, but, but, but from a distance. Uh, here's a thumbnail sketch summary of, of, of a person that has a Martha style of relating to Jesus. Has one tool, one response, and one way of doing almost everything. Uh, you say to Martha, I'm depressed. She's like, let me make you a meal. Let me cook you a meal. My husband left me. Let me make you a pie. Oh, man, I don't know what to do. My kids, I think my kids smoke in pot, and they, they think they're kind of cool. They got it all figured out. They hide it, and blah, 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 blah. Martha's like, let me come home and clean your house. Uh, she, Martha knows how to do for, but she doesn't know how to be with. Uh, here, here, here's another uh, thumbnail sketch. It typically feels underappreciated. Uh, Martha's are, are busy but rarely joyful. Uh, they obsess over possible outcomes. They have every worst case scenario in the world figured out in their mind and what they would do in response to it. Uh, cannot score enough points to feel secure enough to sit down on the inside. Just cannot do enough just to say, you know what? I'm going to just sit back and enjoy. Somebody else can serve this party. Uh, Can give lip service to the idea of change, but rarely changes. 
Uh, service is like an armor which protects them from the vulnerability of being known. Uh, Martha's don't have a lot of really close friends. Uh, they have a lot of people that they do stuff for. Uh, but service is just that armor that keeps everybody at arm's length. Uh, she cleans up after dinner. That's what she does. Whereas, you know, Lazarus is the guy that he lingers long after dinner. Uh, Martha cleans up after dinner. She's the last one to leave. She sends everybody off and is like, I got it. That's her three favorite words. I got it. I got it. Don't worry about it. I got it. Then the Bible goes on and says this. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Verse 3. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Mary enters the room. She's the third person who shows up in the text. Mary's statement, bless you. Uh, Mary's question is simply this. What does Jesus want from you? What does Jesus want from you? Her word is intimacy. And this is her, her phrase, her question. This is her statement. Commitment is what you're willing to do, but intimacy is what you're willing to do without. Mary kind of demonstrates. She doesn't say it. She doesn't have it on a t-shirt. But she's just kind of, this is her statement to us with her life. Every time you see her, commitment is what you're willing to do, but intimacy is what you're willing to do without. So she can show up with this, this pint of pure nard, worth about a year's wages, by the way. 300 denarii is what they, people made, the average worker made in a year. But she has such, unless you understand this about a Mary, their life doesn't make sense. It bothers you. You always question their motives. Oh, she's showing off. Or he's just doing that to get attention. No, no, no. It could probably is their intimacy is just a little deeper and bigger than yours. And so behavior, that intimacy kind of produces certain behaviors in them. Because Mary has a deep sense of understanding. She has a sense of what God is doing. And that informs what she believes needs to be done. She lives from the inside out. Martha lives from the outside in. Mary lives from the inside out. Understanding is a byproduct of slow intimacy. This kind of understanding is the byproduct of slow intimacy. Uh, I heard a guy talk about one time going to a Quaker uh, they call it a meeting, the Quakers, the, 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 the denomination. And the, the Quakers, they were sitting there, and they're just all quiet. And this guy leans over. He goes to a church like ours. He leans over, and he says, when does the service start? And the old Quaker man said, as soon as the meeting's over. <laughs> and it's just like, ah, I don't get it. Yeah, M Mary would be great in that environment. Uh, it, it's what's true of Mary is what's true of Moses. The Bible says this about Moses. It says, God revealed his acts to the children of Israel, but his ways to Moses. She kind of got not just what Jesus did, but why he did it. Uh, she practiced what Richard Foster talked about. A guy named Richard Foster wrote a book called The Freedom of Simplicity. And in the book, he says this. He says, after a certain amount of immersion in public life, I begin to burn out. And I've noticed that I burn out inwardly long before I do outwardly. Hence, I must be careful not to become a, a, a frenetic bundle of hollow energy, busy among people but devoid of life. I must learn when to retreat like Jesus and experience the recreating power of God. We are told that Peter tarried in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. And along our journey, we need to discover numerous tarrying places where we can receive heavenly manna. Mary. If there was a word that really described, she was always tarrying. Typically in the presence of Jesus, just kind of hanging out, being actively present in a non-anxious way. Here's some characteristics of a Mary. Uh, number one, lives with a sense of devotion to who God is and what he is doing. A sense of devotion to who God is and what he's doing. Uh, the Marys of this life, they're not obsessed with managing their sin because they don't sin as much as they used to. And that sounds like a crazy statement. It is, I remember standing at a conference, and, and we were talking, some of us around talking, and this one guy asked us, this guy standing next to me, he goes, hey, man, how do you manage your sin? And he goes, I just don't do that that much anymore. And our first thought was, oh, man, you're kind of prideful. Because the assumption, whether we want to face it or not, is, oh, everybody does. And that, you know what Christianity about is just a gospel of sin management? And the guy just kind of said, you guys are still trying to manage your sins, and I just, I'm just done with sin. I've wasted enough time doing that. I want to enjoy everything else Jesus makes available besides forgiveness. And there was probably eight people standing there, and seven of us didn't know what to say. It was just like, we couldn't decide, you were the most arrogant Christian I've ever met, or 
hold me. <laughs> it was just weird. And so everybody, no one said a word. It was just kind of, uh, uh, well, okay, see you at the next session. Hey, what time are you speaking? I, I remember walking away from that and just kind of thinking, but Mary was that way. Mary's that way. She doesn't just look to understand. She, she, she looks to be involved. She engages in behaviors. If you're, if you're a, a, a Mary has a style of relating, engages in behaviors that do not make sense in the moment, but make a big difference in, in, in hindsight. I, I remember at dinner, some of us went, and, and it was kind of like scarecrows coming to a bonfire. How close we want to get to this? And at dinner, this cat said, it wasn't bragging. He just kind of said, with tears in his eyes, you think Jesus died just for you guys to get forgiveness? And there were people that were like, well, I mean, that, 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 that is the gospel. Uh, that is your introduction to the gospel. What is your experience with the gospel? I'd never in my life been around someone that talked that way at that point. But now looking back, I'm like, that, that's, that's a Mary. That guy had that cur- kind of crazy look in his eye that kind of said, either I love Jesus a whole lot or I'm going to kill y'all as soon as we're done with dinner. But the more he talked... I noticed our waitress kept coming to the table and just kind of lingering and looking at him at the expense of all of us. Oh, forgiveness, that's kind of the entryway into that. That's not the experience of the God. I just remember thinking, I think this cat is on a different planet in a good kind of way. Uh, They're often misunderstood. They're seen as different, and they live with a low-grade sense of loneliness and aloneness. Because people, after a while, the conviction gets on you. And you're just kind of like, nah, okay, you can go now. There's something about this person that makes people want to be around them. You don't have language for it. Uh, Marys are slow. They're often seen as having a lack of planning skills. But in reality, they're, they're just not done with the moment when everyone else is done. They're just, they're just not done with it. Uh, doesn't even know that there's a game going on, much less the score. Mary's leave dinner without anybody noticing. They just they don't stay and help clean up. You don't know when they come. I mean, look at the text. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Uh, a, a, a good moral Jewish woman never took her hair down in public. It was a sign of immorality. And before the Pentecost, they had this. You ever seen the Pentecostals? They all wear the hair up in a bun. They believe, this, they believe the same thing. Mary comes in, takes the bobby pins out, shakes her hair and fluffs it. It's not a shampoo commercial. And then she takes a, 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 this, this pure nar, this expensive perfume that's worth a year of what you make right now. Pours it down the feet of Jesus and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And the room is just filled with this fragrance. These people are fragrant people. They leave the smell of them. It's like shaking hands with Johnny Williams. You walk away with the smell on you. You're kind of like, oh, yeah, you shook Johnny's hand today. The Marys, the people that have a style of relating, men and women that relate. I mean, we were all, because this is what I was speaking. And so all of us were speaking the same things, you know, it's super wow and wham, wham, whoopee for Jesus and whatever. And we all were like, hey, man, did you meet that cat that talked about not sinning anymore? He never said, I don't sin anymore. He said, I just don't sin as much as I used to because it's lost interest for me. And I remember thinking, say, What? And yeah, he was just like, hey man, you, you guys are just, that's the experience of the gospel. But, 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 but I mean, that's the entrance into the gospel, but that's not the experience of the gospel. And I just remember thinking, I, slow down, diagram a sentence, that would make sense. Mary just leaves the dinner without anybody noticing. Last character to show up is Judas. Verse 4, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, whom he, who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? See, the Judases of the world have a hard time being honest about their agenda. And so they're always connected to a cause that hides their real motivation. They always got a cause. Well, it's for this, or it's for that, or it's for... He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. His question is this, what do you want from Jesus? What do you really want from Jesus? And if you're honest today, what you really want is Jesus to do all the things that you would do if you were Jesus. His word is agenda. He has an agenda. He had an agenda from the very beginning. 
His statement is this, an agenda is impossible to hide and even more difficult to lay down. An agenda is impossible to hide and even more difficult to lay down. He has a better way of doing things, and if Jesus doesn't come around, then Judas is going to have to take matters into his own hands at great benefit to him and great cost to everybody else. A person that has a Judas style of relating, they don't think about what this is going to mean for other people. They just think, by golly, this is what I think should happen, and I'm not going to lay it down. And they don't, regardless of who has to die. They live with a strict sense of justice. But that's just a thin veneer that covers the greedy self-interest. Here's some characteristics of a Judas. They have a set of expectations which are to be met. If not, then, then, then he or she has another plan. But, 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 the, but, but the ultimate goal is going to be realized. I got a lot of plans to get me there, but it's going to be realized. Uh, a Judas a person has a style of really like Judas. They keep the score. Lazarus forgets what the score is. I mean, poor Mary, I mean, Martha, she can't score enough to feel good. Mary doesn't know there's a game going on, much less the score. Like one of my kids walked in last night and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm watching the, the, the Texas Tech game here. They said, oh, what, what, what is this? Thank you. Thank you. I was like, what? Do the two words March Madness not mean anything to you? Uh, the Marys of the world, they don't, they don't social, they're on Instagram. They don't know anything about all that. They're just kind of like they live just totally disconnected. Like some of my kids. It's like, oh, never mind. Get out of the way of the TV. Uh, uh here's some more about Judas. Faith is in himself and his plan. He can be a pathological liar who simply sees lying as a means to an end. Uh, they're motivated by personal gain. What's in it for me? Uh, they evaluate everything, but they rarely experience anything. Life is transactional, never relational. He pitches a fit over how much dinner costs. I mean, he cannot believe. Why didn't those kids split a Coke? The waitress comes, we don't need a dessert menu. No, we're not getting dessert. Just goes crazy. Why? Because the more you spend on dinner, the less it's going to be left for him to consume upon himself or her to consume upon herself. And so, as I said, kind of a different sermon. Uh, but here's some questions that are going to be on the screen. I want to just to spend some time reflecting this morning, and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, First question is this, what do you do to relax in God's presence? Second question, is there anything that you wish you could quit doing but have yet to figure out how? Thirdly, where are your tarrying places? Where is it like Paul had this guy, Simon the Tanner, and he would just kind of go by, just hang out at his place and stay for day two, three, four? Do you have places that you just tarry? What are some of the bigger agendas in your life these days and how many of them are necessary? And lastly, if you wrote down a one-sentence summary of what you, what you take away from this morning, what would that sentence be? Let me pray. God, we want to just uh, linger in your word. Sometimes we preach the, I mean, we always preach the word uh, with passion here. Uh, and today we just want to linger. We don't want to take a shower. We want this just to kind of be a bath. We just want to immerse ourselves in some ways of thinking about you and the way we relate to you that we wouldn't maybe normally, naturally always do. And that's okay. And so Holy Spirit, just kind of hover over us, brood over us as we brood over this text. As we think about the way we relate to you and what, what motivates our style of relating. Father, I pray today that agendas would just kind of get laid down and left here. That you give us some granularity. It's easy to kind of go, yeah, I like these other people, but I can't stand Judas. And some of us are driven by an agenda. And so let us not just scoff at his, but let us see ours. And so Holy Spirit, just kind of brood over us for a moment. As we just kind of think and linger in and around what the Word says to us today.
Father, give us the, uh, the revelation uh, and the willingness to think about ourselves through the lens of, of the Bible uh, that is comforting and it's exposing. Some of us have a sense right now that somebody left a door open because there's kind of a cold draft blowing through our soul. Because we're afraid that maybe people are going to figure out what our agenda really is. And the reality is, Jesus, you already know. It's why you dip the bread in the cup and pass it down to Judas. And said, whatever you got to do, go, go and do quickly. Let's hurry up and realize the insufficiency of what you've made life all about. And so, Lord, we just uh, we want to relate to you appropriately. And so, Lord, speak to us through the text today. Continue to kind of plow up the ground of our heart and the paths of our life. Lord, we believe what the Bible says, that it's possible just, just, to, just to be done with sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't you know that all of you who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So that you too may be raised to walk in a newness of life. God, I pray that you would increase our curiosity and our appetite for this newness of the life that the gospel affords us. This is our prayer, God. We ask that it be our experience, and we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. If you're our guest today, thanks for being part of, uh, of our service. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to fill out one of the guest cards that's located in the seat backs in your row. And if you have, uh, all we ask of you, you just drop those in one of these uh, wooden boxes by the doors on your way out this morning. Okay? If you have any questions about anything you heard, uh, we have an invitation every Sunday. Uh, it's why myself and some of our uh, pastors and elders will be standing down front when you're dismissed. Uh, speaking of elders, I want to do something. I've been meaning to send you an email, but I just thought that seems way too personal. Uh, there's a man in our church that has served faithfully for an elder for years, and he and his wife are moving uh, in, like in the next month or two. Uh, and I, wanna, I want you to show your appreciation. His name's Paul Keith. Paul, would you stand up? Paul and his wife, Andrea, uh, she is a nurse. She works at a clinic up north. Uh, they're relocating to Spring. Is that the right? Uh, they're building a house in Spring, uh, and we we're sad to see them go, but we rejoice with them. It's a little closer to work, a little closer to family. Uh, and so Paul will be here for probably another month or so, and then as, as he typically does, he will just quietly exit. Uh, he has been a quiet consistent influence on our elder body and you have benefited from this man's personality and gifts and wisdom in ways you don't even know and so uh, if you know Paul I want you to be sure and, and speak a word of appreciation and if you don't you can do the same as well because you've kind of uh, benefited from his quiet leadership all right stand to your feet let me speak a blessing over you hold your hands out Your God is not a God of a shower. He is a God of the bath. Sit down, slow down, and go down. Immerse yourself in the deep warmness of a holy bath. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you.